Hi everyone, I'm Janet Taylor. Welcome to Emergency E-Learning. This um, session is all about going remote with choice, but really it's going to be very helpful for a lot of teachers who are not choice. So just because you're not a choice-based teacher, don't think you can't get anything out of this. Um, I think as we all are navigating this crazy new lifestyle of ours, um, there's a lot of tips and tricks that I have in there um, to talk about overarching beliefs that will help you as you start navigating your classroom uh, remotely. Um, I first wanted to say a big huge shout out to Tim Needles um, for putting all this together and NEA for supporting us. Um, since the cancellation and everything, obviously we can't be in Minneapolis. Instead, you're in my lovely basement. Um, and so if you follow us at hashtag NEA20, you're going to find the schedule for the whole um, event. Okay. If you have questions for me, um, you can tweet them or at JA Taylor Art, or you can always email me at any time. Um, I this is a pre-recording, but I will make sure that I'm accessible during that time slot to answer your questions in real time. Um, but also, of course, anytime you have questions, you can always tweet or email me at any of those uh, contacts. All right, so what's this all about? Well, um, I wanted to talk about choice, but I, I feel like it's such a big topic. Um, and I am going to be presenting through an NAEA webinar on July 1st. So if you've seen me present in the past, it's chock full of information on choice, um, how I set it up in my classroom, how I started um, a studio environment in all of my um, classes um, to get up to AP and whatnot, um, but we don't have that much time today. So um, it's important that you understand that because I'm going to talk about choice going remote. So there's two big pieces that I want to make sure um, when I talk about choice that you understand is the idea of building your curriculum based on your goals and outcomes, and then scaffolding technical and conceptual choice. Those two pieces are really important because they play into how we're going to then move into the remote world. Okay, and through that, we want to look through the lenses of equity and access, as well as creativity, connections, and accountability assessment. Those are the three pieces that I'm really focusing on, uh, on now because I've already gotten my baseline of my um, goals and outcomes, as well as my scaffolded approach. Um, if you see my little uh, video down at the bottom um, and it covers anything, I apologize ahead of time. Okay, so. Um, it's really important that I give you a little bit of background about who I am um, because that really plays into my role as a choice teacher. So I was a scenic artist both in New York City and in Chicago for about 10 years. Um, and then I taught at um, the college level and really fell in love with teaching. So I became a uh, high school art teacher, which is what I'm doing now. Uh, I've been doing that for 10 years at this point. Um, and it's really important to know like jack of all trades, master of none. So all of those little courses under there are all the different kinds of classes that I've taught. And that's because I really feel like I can offer my students a lot, a range of um, media and a range of skills that I can provide for them. Um, but really I'm not, I would not say I'm a master of anything um, except for building curriculum and developing um, that artistic voice in my students. I currently teach uh, three courses. I am part-time, although it doesn't feel like it. Um, but I decided that's by choice. I went part-time by choice. Um, but I currently teach um, AP Art and Design, all three portfolios in one class plus sculpture one and sculpture two and then i teach a class of jewelry medals one through four and then i teach an additional class of photo two traditional like in the dark room and photo three so those are the classes that i'm currently teaching and currently navigating into the remote world um, if you've seen me speak before like i said i talk a lot about my shift in philosophy um, from being a more traditional based teacher um, to kind of my journey of trial and error because again like I said nobody's an expert um, we all go through ups and downs of our learning and our teaching um, so uh, that will be covered more in the summer um, I'm also a, a writer for Art of Education University currently um, so you can access any of my articles there as well Um, it's important to understand what my population is. Okay, so um, I, like I said, I teach high school. I'm in the western suburbs of Chicago. I taught in Chicago public schools um, as well, but currently I'm at a 9 through 12 campus. 
Um, we have semester long courses. My requirements for fine arts is one semester. So the students don't even have to take art. They could take um, band or choir or theater. We have combined courses and combined levels in order to support that need in our, our, with our students. Otherwise, we might lose some students. We wanna make sure we keep um, pushing them towards AP. Um, and then a couple years ago, our students went, our school went one-to-one -one Chromebooks. So that really plays into now how I'm teaching because we're remote and students all have Chromebooks. Um, so I am gonna talk a little bit about that experience for me. We do have a, divert, a fairly diverse population. Our students are very high achieving. We have very high expectations from the community and from the students and from our staff um, to achieve highly. But but we also deal with a lot of social emotional needs from our students. So I usually go into this um, backstory into my choice and tab. I think that's really important to understand why I went into the direction that I did. Um, I'm not going to go into it today, but I do want you to know that I started thinking about um, as I developed my own teaching practice and became more, more, more comfortable with who I was as a teacher and in the classroom, um, I started thinking about or noticing that my students' habits, um, that I wasn't supporting them in their artistic habits. And what I mean by that is that um, I noticed that students were like throwing away artwork or they were not engaged in the process, they didn't understand why, or they were, um, you know, asking me, how can I get an A on this? And that was only what was important, or they didn't know how to think or come up with ideas. Um, and that was very concerning to me. Uh, so I decided then at that point that I needed to focus on their thinking habits. And that is what brought me to Choice and Tap. So uh, ways that we teach and learn are really important to me to look at um, because there's so many different ways that we can teach and learn, right? So on one side, we are looking at projects which are more teacher-driven, you know, step-by-step -step instructions. Um, usually the outcomes are pretty similar. There might be a little bit of choice in them, but the projects are there to build skills and to build confidence. On the other side, we have artworks where students are, um, you know, coming up with their own ideas, their own process and they are developing everything fully themselves and then of course there's everything in between um, between levels of choice to tab and steam and design thinking um, so there's all these different ways that we can teach and learn and what I love about this is that this is the choice continuum right so when we call ourselves a choice teacher. Um, there's a lot of myths or misunderstandings as to what that means. And what I look at that is um, being able to scaffold and structure for our students so that they can make choices that are fully on their themselves, right? So throughout the choice continuum, I love the idea of this slider because you can kind of go back and forth depending on your students' needs, um, their level of choice. So students are learning building uh, skills and they're learning to build some confidence. So they're more on the project end until they start to gain that confidence and move into artwork. You might find that halfway through your students really need to start developing their design thinking um, or maybe you need to give them more in-depth prompts. Um, that slider just moves around depending on your students needs. So how do you figure out how to build your choice curriculum? Well, it, to me, it really comes down to two things, right? The first one is what do I value and what do I know? Those are the two key players into figuring out what it is that you're teaching and how you're going to teach it. So what do I know it comes, there's all these things that come into play, right? So uh, what kinds of classes, how many classes that I'm teaching, uh, the content experience that I have, right? So if I have been teaching digital art for 10 years, or I haven't taught it in 10 years, or I've never taught it, that is really important to know about yourself. My uh, overall teaching experience, right? So am I a first year teacher? Am I a teacher who's, a, am I a veteran teacher who's been teaching for 20 years? Am I a new school? This is all important to know. Um, am I a flexible person? Do I like to be able to respond in the time or do I need to have a set structure? My student population is really important because that plays into how I respond to them. You need to be reflective and responsive at all times to your students' needs. And then of course your community expectations. So what, um, what do they expect? Do they expect you to output a lot of artwork all the time? Does it need to look a certain way? Is that the expectation? Um, how do you shift that expectation, et cetera? 
And then what do I value? So me personally, what do I value um, as my as an art teacher, as teaching art? What do I want my students to come out with? What kinds of best practices are there for teaching? Um, what do I expect, what kinds of art do I expect my students to um, produce? And what level of rigor? What are some of their outcomes? Um, and then of course, like what's the learning environment that's gonna be best conducive to my students? What do I think is a best way to teach and for them to learn? All of those are rooted in students' uh, goals and outcomes. So if you can take a look and basically sort out all those pieces, if you can answer those questions for yourself, um, you can take that information and you can make your goals and outcomes. And that is what should always drive your curriculum. No matter what it is that you're teaching or how you're teaching, you should always be reflective and responsive to that. Um, this is just one way to do that, right? So if I'm looking at what I know, I know here that I teach multiple classes in one period, so that's that's going to obviously impact how I'm delivering my uh, curriculum. I also know what my students value. I know what's important to them. I know that I'm pretty good at organizing content for best learning. Not everybody is, right? Let's be honest. We all have our strengths and weaknesses, so you have to figure out what you know. I also know that process drives product. This is, this is something I actually know. I originally valued it. Now it has turned into something I know. I've seen it happen. I don't think that they are separate process in my mind and product are connected in order to make that happen, right? Um, and I know what my community values, that's really important, okay? I also value technical competence and confidence. I don't wanna say to my students, you can create anything and not be able to give them um, those skill builders to, to hone their technical skills. That's important, right? Because that's, that's part of the process that will then drive their product. Um, I value the visual meaning making piece. I want my students to actually connect meaning. I want to look at my students holistically. I value their growth that they have actually achieved over a semester or a year. I wanna be able to provide them safe practice so that they can take risks and explore and play and not feel like they have to worry about whether it's good enough or not. I want my students to collaborate in order to, to get to their student voice. All of these are factors that I look at for goals and outcomes. Okay, so taking all of that information, how do I then create my goals and outcomes that are gonna stick with me? Um, so me personally, these have been my goals and outcomes. I want to create a culture of art that fosters students who think. And I want to develop students who are prepared for advanced courses and beyond, okay? So all those factors have to go into those pieces, right? It's not just like, that's it, I'm done. I need to look at everything. And you should know that your goals are fluid. That's what that word is behind my video, fluid. These goals will change depending on your students' needs. If you go to another school, over time, students' needs change. Um, you need to be reflective and think about that. Really, every year you should be considering that, okay? So those goals are really important because they're gonna play into how we move into e-learning. Um, the other piece that's really important is how are we scaffolding for our curriculum, right? How are we scaffolding technical and conceptual skills so that students are actually feeling confident in, and competent in what they're doing? So um, I have a real hard time um, believing that there's any one best practice or only one way to teach. Um, I don't like the idea of like these polarized stigmas that exist out there, whether it's political or it's in art education or in my own household. I don't really work with a black or white um, kind of system, but that's just me. I believe that if we kind of go one on the scale or the other on the scale and just stay on our ends, then we are not looking at a holistic approach for all needs. So when we solely teach teacher directed, um, uh, lessons, projects, or we solely do full choice, we're, we're really just missing out on an opportunity to provide our students that, that safe environment to actually practice creating artwork um, through risk taking and experimentation in order to actually connect the technique that they're learning with the visual meaning making. Those are the two pieces that kind of go together. If we only teach technique and everything has a similar outcome, that's awesome that those kids are gonna be like super skilled. But if they can't apply it to do the thinking of the meaning making, the, uh, you know, 
there's a piece missing in my opinion. If we go on the other side and say, let's just only make based on what you think, and we're not going to give you any technical skills or hone those skills, there's a piece missing there too. Um, so, which is a whole nother topic, but anyway, so um, that is kind of my philosophical grounding. So when we look at that choice continuum, it's really important to, to use that as a flexible or fluid slider scale so that we can actually um, address our students' needs. If a kid, if we're teaching skill building to build that confidence and, and we're noticing that the students are struggling, we're not just gonna go on and keep on going forward with full choice, right? We might need to scale it back or figure out how we're gonna scaffold that to provide them more supports. So in an example for that, um, we have our technical skills that we need to teach and our conceptual skills. A lot of times um, teachers, like I said, just focus on one or the other, that's a real problem. If we can focus on our technical skills to start and then start implementing conceptual skills, then they're not overwhelmed with everything at once. So for example, in ceramics, if you're teaching students how, to, how, how clay works, right? Um, and you're doing a pinch pot and you focus just on the form and not worry about the meaning, and just think about form and texture and, and the clay itself, students are more likely to explore and feel good about that, right? Then, um, you know, by the time we get to slabs, for example, um, you know, students can really start to explore more of that conceptual side of things because, or have more choice in how they apply those slabs because they already have some basic understanding of how clay works, right? Then, you can get to the application of those skills to make the artwork, right? So you have to have technical skills, you have to have some conceptual skills in order to put those together to make the artwork. I wouldn't say to my students straight off, hey, okay, here's, um, do a coil vessel with uh, talking about identity when they don't even know how to put two coils together, right? Um, or don't even really know how to explore identity other than putting hearts and stars or whatever about their life, right? So you need to be able to scaffold all of that to provide them as much support as you can. So again, I don't wanna go into this too much in depth, but the, there's the learning management system. Um, there's a lot of ways to basically deliver the content. So we have a learning management system. This is really important because when we move to e-learning, um, this is already set up a lot for my classes, right? So students can access this. These, I call them the toolboxes because they they're have they building tools into their toolboxes that they can pull out when they need to make the artwork, right? Um, so in that case, it's great because I can toss in videos, I can toss in little formative assessments, I can toss in their assignment for them to work on, and they can kind of work at their own pace. There's of course the whole class, um, small group expert teacher one-on-one. -on -one. So what I mean by that is um, whole class, I actually found that as I moved into choice, I'm less of a teacher so much as a guide on their experience, I would say, you know. Um, but I, I actually find that whole class instruction is kind of difficult for me now, um, but that's because students have so many needs and we wanna be able to address them. So a lot of times I teach more in smaller groups, um, depending on their needs, it's very differentiated. Or if, I'm, if I taught one student advanced technique and another student was curious about it, I'd say, oh, go ask the expert teacher over there, so-and-so. I might even teach them a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, a lot of times uh, teachers, if you're, you know, we're in a, a, a media specific course, but um, other courses like Art Survey or Art One, for example, might have stations around where you could learn about different techniques and try different things. Um, and then of course there's independent research. So students might say, oh, I'm really interested in, in this. So um, they would go ahead and independently research that and work on that. Okay. Um, lastly, all about choice, right, is that as we're building those technical skills and those conceptual skills and we're making artwork, how do you track that? So I value student growth. To me, it is most important that my students are actually able to demonstrate, articulate, understand that the growth that they've made has been able to give them the access to actually make the artwork that they envision. Um, and so we develop growth portfolios throughout the uh, semester or year. It shows student voice. You can see the skills that students are practicing. It uh, focuses on creative process and thinking, and then their application of the meaning and the reflection that goes into that. Students usually um, reflect also on, you know, 
how they learned, how they took that information and moved to the next, um, or applied that to the next artwork. Okay, that was a lot, but that's like a really big uh, nutshell on how I structured choice, starting from my philosophical background through some of the logistics. So that's really important for you to know because that completely has impacted how I am teaching remotely right now. Okay. Thank you, COVID-19, for really throwing us for a loop. Um, I would first say that um, when all of this kind of happened, we learned about this, you know, we kind of had, so I'm in Illinois, western suburbs of Chicago, and I have been kind of watching California and New York, um, as well as obviously Italy and China, um, kind of going through all of this. But watching it from afar, um, I feel like we kind of knew that this was coming, but obviously nobody knew that it would have this impact. So um, I want to preemptively say that everything I'm doing is um, in triage mode, right? So there's my triage nurse, um, because we in, in our school um, found out kind of, we were thinking about it on Wednesday and Thursday um, of last week. And so we were thinking, or I guess two weeks ago now. So Thursday and Friday, we started thinking, oh my gosh, um, this could happen. How are we going to address this? How are we going to prepare our students? But administration and, um, and politics had not played into this, so we didn't know what was happening. By Friday um, of that day, we were told that afternoon that we would be closing school. Um, and at that point, we were trying to figure out what to do within those couple of days. So between Wednesday and Friday, we had this window. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like for us. Um, by Tuesday, we implemented e-learning. Um, so our school is very aggressive on that front. Um, and so I feel like, I don't know about you guys, but it feels like a month has passed in only a couple of days. And now that it's already been a week, I feel like many months have gone by. Um, it's crazy. So triage is the first and, first, first and foremost important thing for you to do. Um, so if you guys have not gone to remote yet or you anticipate it or you're on spring break and you're kind of moving into that world right now, I would highly suggest you give yourself a break and realize that you need to first assess the situation. Um, you need to provide as much as you can in such a short amount of time to establish a routine and connections and then kind of go from there. So um, I did my triage, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but then it comes down to those two questions again. Those are what I know and what I value. So while things have changed, um, I still know a lot, okay? And my values have not changed. And so those are the pieces that are still driving those two goals that I talked about earlier. So the first one is, I still believe that I need to create a culture of art, art that fosters students who think. So no matter what my situation is, that is what I still want to deeply believe in. I also still want to be able to develop students who are prepared for advanced courses and beyond. Okay, so these two goals are going to play into how I'm teaching remotely. Um, through the lens of equity and access, creativity and connections, and accountability and assessment. Now, I would like to say that obviously none of these things, all of these things are incorporated into the classroom. None of them are like separate of learning or classroom learning, right? Or e-learning versus classroom learning. All of these three components are important no matter what you do, but sometimes they're taken for granted, right? Equity and access is a little bit easier in the classroom when we're providing students with materials um, and the learning, right? It looks a little different. Now that we're remote, we have to really look through that lens and see what's going on before we can actually you know, process all of this, okay? So let's take a look at those. So the first one is equity and access through technology. So first of all, like I said, our district is one-to-one -one Chromebooks and um, there are so many apps out there. I love that we can just deliver our content to our students. We can um, make videos, submit those to them. They can access that. Um, but there are some other issues, right? So especially me who's teaching AP, my students are um, trying to do stuff on Photoshop. They might not have Photoshop at home. And so therefore we need to start looking at alternatives or other apps to use. Now these are all great, especially what I love are all these um, 
virtual tours that we can do now on, uh, through art museums. So we can connect with our students through that too. Now, I would like to say though, it's great that my kids all have Chromebooks one-to-one -one technology. That doesn't mean that they all have internet at home. So there's a, a disconnect there too that we need to make sure that we're looking at, right? So um, there's that. And then there's also, of course, I will just on a side note say, I also don't want all of my students sitting on their Chromebooks all day. They're doing that in their other classes. So how can we make sure that the learning to them is also accessible? Um, so as far as technology, we might have to um, come up with worksheets or instructions. Now those are my general like little worksheets right examples, but you might have like step by step like this is your lesson plan. You might have to print off your um, presentation or send it to your admin so that they can print it off and then get it to the kids somehow. Um, you know, we need to be able to provide as much access to the curriculum as we can. The other thing, of course, is materials. That's a big piece. Now, I teach metalsmithing. My kids are not going to go home and do metals or use a torch. That's just not going to happen. Clay is also an issue. I know it, um, that's more of a common thing. Teachers have been like, what am I supposed to do? Put a ball of clay in a bag and send that home? Um, if you can, that's great, but not everybody can, right? Um, so we need to start thinking about what kinds of materials our students have readily available. Um, as much as we can, and we need to also be able to provide them as much access to different types of options that we can. So for example, I know that my students might not have, um, you know, to be able to make jewelry out of metals, right? So I'm gonna come up with, I know that most kids have paper, they might have newspaper, they might have, you know, whatever, they can create and design with that. They can use folds, they can um, just play with it, I don't know, right? So I'm gonna give them as much access to materials as I can. Um, you also need to think, like I said, in the prompt world, we might not want to say like, okay, I'm going to make a sculpture with 50 pencils. Not every kid has 50 pencils at home. So you need to be able to give them options, right? Something to think about. And then of course, if you can't come up with some of that stuff or you want them to still think about specific um, forms or something like that, um, you can always give them those prompts and ask them to sketch, right? Those are always available to us, are usually a paper and a pencil. They can sketch um, and use that in their designs. Oh, and then the last one is, um, we knew, like I said, we kind of started preemptively thinking about this. So I had actually asked my AP kids and my sculpture kids to write a list of materials that they think they might use and start packing boxes ahead of time. Um, so if you are like, okay, I'm on spring break, um, our school is closed, or maybe some of you, I don't know, are, are some of you still in, in school? Um, you could pack some of those boxes and get them to the kids or they can come and pick them up. We've had that too. But my, uh, my colleague Janelle uh, Modest, she packed little paint boxes for the kids, bundles of brushes, and then the kids signed them out, okay? So there's a lot of things that we can try to think about ahead of time that would help. Um, the next thing we need to think about is our actual curriculum that we're giving them. So I look at always, always, always here, creativity and connections. Those are like the two big pieces for me right now during e-learning, right? So the first one is I want my students to start thinking about playing with materials. Now, here's the thing. When we are in class, I can sit there and say, here's some coffee, here's some tea, here's some sprinkles, whatever it is, to make your um, paint and go ahead and play and see what happens. I'm providing that. So that's a piece that they don't have to think about and they can just play. But ask, actually asking students to go around the house and think about what kinds of materials could be sol soluble to do this. Um, these are things that are gonna take a little bit more time and they may need a little more help with. So just because we think, oh, it's accessible to them doesn't mean that they're they're able to put those two and two together to actually um, play with, right? So just keep that in mind, okay? The, the creativity is where I'm focusing on the most of my students. So I feel like those are skills that students can take, whether this is the only class or class they're taking with me, or let's say they decide to take drawing two next year. Well, they may not come in with the same drawing technical skills as my kids from last semester or last year, but they will come in with creative thinking that is so important in what I teach them, right? Um, I also think that if a student is going to be moving into anything in their life, um, creativity is going to help them. So I try to look again, that goes back to my goal of trying to make sure that my students are developed as artists, uh, um, 
whether they move up or in some other capacity in their life, okay? So you guys may have seen um, creative creativity challenges. I've uh, tweeted that out a bunch. My colleagues and I are kind of pulling stuff from the internet from you guys. Um, you've been awesome, but also creating our own and kind of tossing them in the slides. The, the community of sharing in art is amazing, I have to say. Um, you could also come up with some design thinking challenges. I think those are really important to get kids to think um, about um, you know, some, some things that are like unimaginable, right? Like design a treadmill for a worm. A worm is not going to need a treadmill, right? But it starts getting kids to think about, um, different ways to, um, you know, design technology or whatever it is, right? To answer a problem, right? To solve a problem. Um, my friend uh, Matt Milkowski helped me come up with a bunch of these different ones that you're, you see there. Develop a chair for an octopus, create a watch for a ghost. Um, these like outlandish ideas are really creative and help kids think outside the box and also outside of the Chromebook. Um, and then my colleague Marie Weston came up with a bunch of these challenges too um, that are really great. They're, they're long term, they're more longer term. So they might be more of like three day challenge. So in this uh, example she pulled um, creatures of comfort you know coming up with a spirit creature that helps protect you from illness um, so she talks a little bit about you know giving uh, in there you can see, you'll see in the yellow part it talks about like different days now this is my one suggestion to for this is that um, especially if you're a choice teacher um, you know what happens in our classroom and what happens out of our classroom it's like the kids are reset so um, they are transitioning to their new reality. If I'm teaching my kids how to do metal smithing and I'm asking them to provide me drawings, that's difficult for them, right? Now, of course, I ask them to sketch or whatever. I'm just coming off that with my head. But if I'm not actually teaching them to technically draw, then I shouldn't expect probably more than little sketches on a loose leaf paper, right? Um, that could be materials all that they have, but it also could be just, um, you know, that that's the skill set that they have, or who knows, right? There's a lot of factors that go into play here. When you're thinking about structuring your lessons in remote learning, the smaller the better, or the ch more chunked the better. Um, unless you have taught your students how to handle long term assignments, um, and you've taught them how to use executive functioning, you can't expect them to just figure that out on their own right now. So um, manage them a little bit more tightly than you normally might um, because you're not over them, looking over their shoulder, helping them along the way, okay? Um, so chunking is a good thing. All right, um, connecting through collaboration. So connections, connections, connections. I cannot say this enough. Um, my colleagues and I, we decided the first day of e-learning, like I said on that Tuesday, we wanted to see our kids. So um, one of the big, it kind of made me laugh, right? Like we left on a Friday and then Sunday night, I was like in tears thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna see my students again. And it felt so silly because I'm like, this is just a weekend. It's just like a regular weekend. Um, but the reality of all this kind of hit me. And um, needing to connect with my students was important and, and my students really need to connect with me. I am their stability and their routine as well, um, just like you guys are, right? So connecting with them is really important. On our very first day, we decided to ask them to provide us a video or a little um, narrative about kind of how they're feeling about things and what are they making and are they bored and what kind of junk food are they eating, right? Um, and it was a great way to really connect with the students. But there's other ways to do that in your curriculum now. So in the everyday, we see them and we talk to them, but we're also doing things like critiquing and working through that. Um, I had my students submit work on Canvas and I realized it was an assignment and other kids couldn't see what other kids had created and I wanted them to be able to experience that, right? So I realized I needed to adapt that and I changed it to my Google Slides where everybody could view it and edit it and then they could add their own slide and eventually you know, they'll critique off of that. Um, I also held a Zoom call with my AP kids. Only about half of them showed. It's, you know, it's difficult um, because of timing and everything, but, you know, just to see their faces, it was just such a wonderful experience. And to instruct and give them information I needed to give them at one time instead of, um, you know, doing a video, waiting for the responses, waiting to respond to them, it was just a really great way to connect. Um, I had them do like little emojis to go with their progress work, and um, you can see, so, 
it's important that some of them are feeling panicked, some of them are feeling overwhelmed, some of them are feeling bored, you know? It's really, really important to connect with your students right now. This is their reality. You used to be their reality. So we need to give them that safe space. Okay, accountability and assessment. So um, this keeps coming up. This is like the billion dollar question that I don't know if I have an answer for yet. So we'll see. Um, but in the classroom, there's accountability, right? Like I'm walking around, the students raising their hand, um, students on their phone, I can be like, get off your phone. Um, but at home, it's not, right? So we need to look at these, this class, like I kind of mentioned, as if um, they're the same class, you know how they work, you know who they are, you know all their background and everything, but there are totally new circumstances that we all need to adjust and transition to. Both you, um, you know, me working from home, my kids running around like crazy, my husband working from home, it's a lot, right, to juggle. So they are too, and we need to think about them setting up these new structures. Um, when we, you know, if I were to establish an e-learning class from the beginning, I would be setting up structures, right? I would be like, this is what you do, and then this is how you submit this, and da 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 This is how you work together and collaborate together. This is like, fl has flipped them upside down, and so expecting them to know what your expectations are, um, it's almost like you just really have to reestablish what that looks like. Um, cut yourself some slack, so if kids don't do the work, kids don't show up, um, just or, or the level of rigor is just not there, make sure that you're not going, oh my God, I can't believe they didn't do that. But take a moment to say, you know what? Okay, let's see what they need. If you were in the classroom and a student wasn't performing the way you expected, you would adjust that and, um, and work with them, right? So you need to figure that out too. Like adjust your lessons for the needs that are there. there this is the new normal. So the question came up to me the other day was, uh, Janet, how do you assess now? So how do you assess in choice and how do you assess in remote? What does that look like? Um, so I don't wanna go into crazy depth, but I'll tell you a little bit in the classroom. Um, I have three different practices that I put into place and I've kind of been developing over the years. The first one is my pretty much standard, my formative practice summative application. So in choice, I have my formative practice, which is that skill building, conceptual building, uh, conceptual skill building, the technical skill building. Um, and then the artwork is the application of all those tools. And so that is the summative piece, right? So um, everything else is practice, usually by towards uh, maybe the second, like two thirds of the way through, halfway to two thirds of the way through, um, students are working on artwork where they're actually doing the summative work. And then their final exam is that um, growth portfolio. I've also been working through levels of mastery. Now my district is starting to go one, um, go uh, into standards-based grading, I think, next year. And so I've started playing with levels of mastery and seeing what that looks like as far as giving my students feedback. Um, but then of course, I actually implemented this year this no grades um, assessment, and it has actually been going really well. I've been saying it for a while, I better put my money where my mouth is. Um, everybody's like, oh, choice, you know, you went choice, and so like all of a sudden kids are super engaged, and I'm like, ah. I don't know what, to, I don't think it's quite like that. It's not like magical experience. It's taken me years to develop this. But I thought, you know, I, I do want to authentically say, are they responding solely by grades still? Or is this really, they're just really interested in the work? Um, so this year in my jewelry metals class, I went no grades. They still have to get a grade for their transcript. Um, but most of that is based on that feedback loop. Um, they work through the studio habits of mind. There's executive functioning that goes into play um, as far as um, time management. And so all of that is holistically looked at. And then we talk about their grade at, towards the end. So those are the three capacities that I'm grading in. Um, so what does that look like with e-learning? Well, okay, so the first thing is, is we were told you're not allowed to grade anything. And um, students can't, if they turn something in or if they don't do the work, then um, it can't be held against them and they don't have to make it up when they come back to class. And I'm like, I get it, I totally get it through the equity lens, you know, we need to look at that. Um, but as a teacher, you're also like, well, how do I hold them accountable for this work? Um, we do do attendance. It is not um, been, we have not been told to do this by our, our governor, but attendance is taken and it's not held against them. It's just really mostly for wellness checks. I think the attendance is helpful because it is getting students to like show that they're actually 
um, engaging with your class. And then um, based on the type of class that I'm teaching or the students that I'm teaching, I think that is um, more about how their engagement is looking or the accountability. So obviously if they're in my AP class, they have that AP exam to get to. So um, that is still kind of their driving force. If they're moving on to the next level, I'm looking at that for their grading. If it's their last class, um, you know, they might not care. I don't know, right? So um, if we do grade, which our district has not gone into this yet, but we have been told by our um, state that we can grade, but they cannot hurt against a student's grade. Like it cannot hurt them. Um, and so if our district goes into this, we as um, my colleagues and I have decided that we probably will do this like three, two, one, zero bonus point system. And so what that looks like is um, if the student does not attempt the work, they will get a zero on it, but that zero does not act like a zero point. It's like a zero extra credit point. So you don't get an extra bonus, right? Um, if the student does uh, some, some attempt, they can earn one point. If they do a full attempt or mostly full attempt, they can get like a two point. And if they go above and beyond our expectations, then they get that three point. And so hopefully it's like basically like my no grades class, I guess, that, you know, um, these are only things that will help them. And so they can, they, it, it's like an incentive to continue to work. We'll see if it actually works or goes into place. So um, thank you. Okay. So I wanted to kind of wrap up into the four things to focus on with the takeaway. Okay, so the first one is the scaffolding. Um, then, oops, my animations are a little off. Okay, so the first one is scaffolding. We always wanna make sure that we're aligning our goals and outcomes, whether it's in the classroom or out of the classroom to support students with both technical and conceptual learning. So those are what's driving our goals and outcomes. Those goals and outcomes are what are kind of like our mission statement that sticks with us, whether we're in the classroom or not. And that is what will drive our next journey into e-learning. Then it's important to look at our e-learning through the lens of equity and access to consider all students' needs and circumstances that they might be going through. To be looking at creativity in order to exercise that creative thinking skills that can apply to any next step of where they're gonna go in their life. and then continuing that sense of belonging and collaboration through forming connections. Those are so essential right now in this time of instability. We want to give those kids the stability that they deserve um, and for you too, right? Um, so those are my four main things as you transition into remote that I would say um, go into play for any teacher. Choice especially that scaffolding is going to be important. Um, so that is kind of my four main takeaways I wanted you to know about. So again, a special thank you to Tim Needles and NAEA for supporting us into making this happen. It's an incredible experience. Um, follow us through the rest of the schedule of the weekend. Um, and then if you want to access, um, ask me questions or access anything, go ahead and shoot me an email or follow me um, on Twitter at J.A. Taylor. Art, if you wanted to see my students' works, um, you will be more likely to follow at NNHS Art. That is more of the students' work. Um, J.A. Taylor Art is more of my art education kind of side of things. Um, okay, so hopefully this was helpful to you, and I hope everyone is well and safe, um, and Godspeed to everybody. <laughs>